Welcome to Kingsdown School Creative Eye Media, Unit R081, Lesson 13, Health and Safety. So today we'll be taking a much closer look at the legislation for health and safety within everything that we do in eye media. Because it's legislation, it is of course similar to those that we looked at in Lesson 9, but because health and safety is applicable in just about everything we do within our creation of iMedia, it warrants a much, much closer look. It encompasses everything that we do in terms of the places that we go, the people that we work with, the equipment that we use, how we use it, and a host of other things that you wouldn't normally think possibly may come under that, such as traveling to those locations and also your reporting of uh, things that uh, normally speaking uh, are not your responsibility but in this case actually they are so it's uh, an, an area that's important to us it's an area that we need to spend uh, a bit more time on it looks uh, a little closer at things like how we use our computer equipment which obviously we spend quite a lot of time doing in IT um, and can within the iMedia settings. So it's uh, definitely something that we want to uh, spend some time getting to grips with. So let's uh, waste no more time and dive straight on in. So the objective of today's lesson is to be able to understand the health and safety requirements that are applicable in creating of iMedia. Now, the success criteria that we apply to that would be that you are able to understand and apply the necessary health and safety regulations that control the creation of iMedia. Now, that doesn't sound like uh, a, a terribly large undertaking, um, but it does actually cover a magnitude of things that uh, probably in the most part, a lot of people would refer to as common sense. But in fact, there are rules and regulations that are applicable for those things to be happening and to control how they happen. So let's have a little look. Why do we need to look at health and safety and legislation? Well, one, it's in the syllabus, um, but obviously it's also very useful if we are actually um, going to do things like uh, create eye media in any setting. Now that's not just a case of on your computer, that's also a case of media products such as film. So if you are going to be doing uh, film work such as the ones that we normally do in unit R089, then there is a possibility that you will be doing some filming on location, i.e. away from your desks, away from your studios, okay, and out in the uh, great world world. That means that there are a number of rules that you need to take account of before you can carry on. So the legislation that actually comes into place. The Designs and Patents Act, the Trademark Act and the Registered Designs Act. We see those mainly um, in things that we would create for stationary pictures so if we were to get uh, things off the internet etc then those are the types of uh, acts of parliament that would restrict what we can use and how we can use it so you've encountered this before so the um, trademarks act obviously you can't just take uh, the you know the coca-cola um, logo and use that willy-nilly you have to have permission from the company to do so Registered Designs Act stops you from taking an idea um, from someone and using it for yourself without actually giving them the um, credit for coming up with the idea. And the Designs and Patents Act is a similar thing. And again, that will cover um, things uh, intellectual property wise. Now, when you're talking about moving images, then Video Recordings Act and the Communications Act and I said in the creation of all of these things is covered by the Health and Safety or Work Act. Now, the act that uh, we're looking at here is the Health and Safety at Work Act, but 
because it actually covers so many of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, then it is important that we understand that it affects these other um, acts of parliament that actually we have to take account of. So first things first, health and safety is the responsibility of everybody. Okay, it is a responsibility that in all walks of life, basic health and safety considerations are uh, taken and observed and necessary precautions are taken to protect both the people doing the work and the general public and anyone else um, that comes into contact during any of these activities that we've been talking about. Now, most of these um, regulations, as they were, are enforced by organization called the HSE. That's the Health and Safety Executive and they are the division of national government that is actually set up to make sure that all of those regulations are enforced and all the policies and procedures are followed. Now each organization if it has over five employees is required to have its own health and safety policy actually written down. Now, if you have less than five employees, then you can take it that it's a word of mouth. Um, but if not, then you must write that policy down. So as you can see here, this is an example of a health and safety policy for an organization. It has who is responsible for the day-to-day uh, enforcement of the health and safety policies and in particular which specific regulations and guidelines are need to be um, enforced and obviously what actions that actually um, are necessary by those people who come into contact with these particular regulations by whatever means, whether that means you're an employee and you're actually doing something which is regulated or whether in fact you're a member of the public and you're being protected by people doing exactly what they should be under the regulations. So let's have a look here. This is the Health and Safety Executive um, website and as you can see it's got a huge amount of information and one of the first things that it deals with here straight away after its overview is identifying the hazards and this is one of the cornerstones of health and safety regulations it is the understanding that you do not necessarily need to remove all the hazards but you do need to identify them and take all necessary precautions to make sure that those hazards don't become a problem so in other words we all know that electricity can be a hazard but of course if it's actually dealt with in the right way if the right precautions are taken then it doesn't cause anyone a problem so that's the same principle that goes throughout health and safety regulations as a whole so how do we identify the hazards well one of the first things that we do is to do a risk assessment now these are carried out on all premises locations where people work or undertake leisure activities and you even do it to a certain extent at home but you just might not realize that you've done it because you don't necessarily write it down but that assessment is used to identify any potential risk of harm and to state what precautions need to be taken to mitigate or nullify the risk and the most obvious one here if you're thinking about a home setting is when somebody has a new child or has a young child and they go to a new house one of the first things that they will do is things like putting stair gates to make sure that uh, children don't go on stairs when they're not actually equipped to uh, use them properly yet um, things like plug sockets sometimes get those little covers on them and you get um, little clips to stop cupboards being opened etc etc these are done as a result of someone assessing what the risk should be and then putting something in place to make sure that that risk actually doesn't cause a problem they've not removed the risk the stairs are still there 
So the risk that somebody could fall down a set of stairs still exists, but the probability of that happening has been reduced because someone has assessed the situation and taken necessary precautions, i.e. they've installed a gate. OK, so the first thing that I would like you to do is to actually create a risk assessment form. Pretty much uh, the way that uh, this one's done here. OK, and that way you can fill in as it says there, what the place is, so the location, what the potential risk is, the actions to minimize the risk, and the pers person responsible for ensuring the action is taken. And again there, I will point out again, it is actions to minimize the risk, not to remove it. So let's go over that again. Important things to remember about risk assessments. It is not incumbent upon anyone to actually remove the risk, only that precautions are taken to ensure that the potential for harm is minimized and that anyone coming into contact with the hazard knows which precautions need to be taken to ensure their own safety. Now, here's another interesting thing here. I mentioned it once already, the law recognizes that all of us as individuals has a part to play in our own health and safety precautions. This means wherever an organization or um, company or necessary, there are safety equipment provided or instructions have been given, signs have been put up. It is our responsibility individually to actually follow those instructions or use that equipment. If we do not, and we get injured, then the law says that we are responsible, not anyone else. Now, in the workplace, this will translate to, normally speaking, a health and safety strategy based on the risk assessments and then obviously with the equipment um, provided. In a school setting, for you guys, you will know this as things like if you went into any of the uh, design technology rooms, I'm sure, and you were, were going to uh, use tools, there'd be warning signs up. If you wanted to use drills, uh, pillar drills or something like that, then they would have to have safety um, um, visors um, or goggles issued to the person who's using them, in addition to it having a shield on the uh, um, actual drill itself. You know, when you are doing things like uh, catering in DT and you go to the oven, you're expecting to be using oven gloves or something else to protect your hands. OK, when you do art, you have a normally speaking, if you're painting, you'd have an apron to protect your clothes. These are all what we would call common sense. But unfortunately, if any organization doesn't supply the equipment then unfortunately they would be responsible if anyone then is harmed as a result of not having that equipment available now as i said before the health and safety regulations cover a huge number of things that you might not normally think of the first three on this list here you'll no doubt recognize electrical safety fire safety and gas safety I think most of the uh, um, uh, issues around those we will probably be familiar with. However, harmful substances may be one that you just don't think of normally. I'm sure you all know that, you know, some of the uh, chemicals in the uh, science labs are dangerous. Um, however, you might not automatically sort of register the fact that just cleaning agents are quite often harmful substances. They've either got acid or alkaline bases to them and each of those if they're at one end or other of, of the ph scale will actually cause you a problem if they get on your skin so on and so forth so again protective measures need to be taken when using these things and they need to have those precautions stated and also how to deal with any breach um, so that is why you quite often see on packets you know if this is spilt on the skin do x y or z Machinery, plant and equipment, probably not something that we're going to encounter too often. Um, but if there's any equipment, as I said, that you're being used, like drills, etc., then you do need to take account of the health and safety um, requirements. Manual handling. 
Again, one that you might not think about too readily. Um, manual handling covers things like ladders. It covers things like sack barrows, sack trucks, forklifts, and things like that. Uh, and when I say that, the manual forklifts where you pump up the, uh, the pallets and things like that. We don't have them very often, but occasionally we might, uh, might need to use them. And again, we should only use those if we've had the necessary training and know what the regulations say about these things. Noise. Noise is something that uh, we probably won't um, encounter too often, but it's things like if you um, work alongside things that are really noisy. So if you are actually working in a uh, construction or demolition um, role and you are using uh, a pneumatic drill, or you were perhaps working uh, for the Navy and you're on an aircraft carrier, you know, and you're on you're on the deckhand. Um, those places do have lots of noise, and you would need to wear appropriate ear defenders uh, and, and make sure that you observe um, those particular requirements. Personal protective equipment um, is something that uh, we should be aware of: goggles, gloves, aprons, as already mentioned. Pressure equipment, probably again something that we will not encounter too often in our media, but occasionally we do. Pressure equipment is things like uh, um, steam, uh, which quite often comes alongside things like radiators. Uh, radiators themselves, as you'll see underneath, we've got uh, radiation itself that is, you know, r radiating panels, whether that be the actual radiators themselves or quite a lot of uh, the classrooms in Kingstown itself have uh, radiation panels, certainly in the VLC. Now, slips and trips, this is something that uh, on your health and safety should be right there at the top. Um, it's something that can be mitigated, but can never be eradicated and by slips and trips we mean things like bits of carpet that are just raised um, especially on things like stairs that can become really dangerous and again because we are all responsible for health and safety those are the type of things that we would expect people to report to us and if they are reported need to be sorted out fairly quickly vibration um, again not one that we would encounter very often um, working in eye media again that's more for things like construction but working at height now that can be it's quite often that we in eye media when we're doing um, film work might want to have aerial shots or high shots and we might need to be on scaffolding to get those uh, and therefore all of the regulations about working at height come into play um, you know making sure that you've got uh, a, a tower set up and it's uh, properly set up so that uh, it's not going to topple over people working on it have um, the right sort of harnesses and perhaps also then they would have um, uh, such things as safety safety ropes as well to attach them all of that comes in into the guidelines working in confined spaces is uh, another thing again you might not think about it uh, straight away but um, unless you've actually been working in confined spaces you don't realize actually how much um, oxygen we actually take in uh, and how much carbon dioxide we actually give out and how much that has an effect in, in a small space it can get used up really really quickly so the last thing there is workplace transport again if we're working on site um, if we were taking say a school a minibus out we would need to make sure that all of the rules and regulations about uh, transport were followed so as i said i wanted you to create a, a, a risk assessment uh, perhaps in your book or on a piece of paper so that you can start to uh, understand exactly what needs to happen okay personal health and safety now one thing that really is going to be uh, affecting virtually everything we do in creative eye media is working with the display screen equipment now as well as general guidance from the hse there's specific guidance for this type of work and especially for those that spend a lot of time working with display screen equipment 
And the main thrust of um, the guidelines here again is once again, analyze what is actually happening and then to reduce the risks. Now, the type of risks that they're talking about here are things like um, getting headaches um, because of working with the screens and uh, not taking regular breaks or your eyesight might be deteriorating. You might have your posture is wrong, so therefore you are not totally comfortable or the way that you're sitting over a period of time with the actions that you're doing repetitively causes a problem. So there are rules and regulations that, uh, that that cover this, and again, this comes under the H, uh, the HSE, the Health and Safety Executive. They are there to uh, make sure that these rules are properly adhered to by the organisations that employ people and have them use computer screens on a regular basis. So, if we have a look at that list that the HSE has produced, as you'll see, just things like the keyboards, the ergonomics of your environment, in other words, how you fit into your environment and how you actually use your equipment actually has a bearing. As you can see here, there is a quite comprehensive checklist about how you should be sitting what height you should be at, what's a comfortable height to have your screen at while you're working. And of course, this list only comes into play though, for those people that spend a significant amount of their working day in front of the computer. So if you go back to our school situation, if we think about that for general lessons, Generally speaking, the longest lesson we're going to have is a double, and therefore we're only going to be in front of the computer for a couple of hours, and then we would take a break. And that is part of the legislation. It is ensuring that those breaks are taken by those people that work for a longer time. So if you were to work in front of a desk all day, you would expect every two hours to have a break. You'd expect to have a longer break in the middle of the day, and quite often you would would not uh, it would not be frowned on should I say to, to say that you probably have a break every hour right let's move along so last thing to do here I would now like you to take a look at all of these questions I would like you to answer those questions and then email them to your class teacher so that they know that you have engaged properly with this lesson. Once you've done that, obviously, you can move on to the homework that will be posted alongside this lesson, and you can answer these exam questions and then answer the quiz that will be there as well. Hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next one.